chapter ten part two of the legends of the jews volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the legends of the jews volume four by lewis ginsburg chapter ten part two the exile the great lament on his return from anathoth jeremiah saw at a distance smoke curling upward from the temple mount and his spirit was joyful he thought the jews had repented of their sins and were bringing incense offerings once within the city walls he knew the truth that the temple had fallen a prey to the incendiary overwhelmed by grief he cried out o lord thou didst entice me and i permitted myself to be enticed thou didst send me forth out of thy house that thou mightest destroy it god himself was deeply moved by the destruction of the temple which he had abandoned that the enemy might enter and destroy it accompanied by the angels he visited the ruins and gave vent to his sorrow woe is me on account of my house where are my children where my priests where my beloved but what could i do for you did i not warn you yet you would not mend your ways to-day god said to jeremiah i am like a man who has an only son he prepares the marriage canopy for him and his only beloved dies under it thou doest seem to feel but little sympathy with me and with my children go summon abraham isaac jacob and moses from their graves they know how to mourn lord of the world replied jeremiah i know not where moses is buried stand on the banks of the jordan said god and cry thou son of amram son of amram arise see how wolves have devoured thy sheep jeremiah repaired to the double cave and spake to the patriarchs arise ye are summoned to appear before god when they asked him the reason of the summons he feigned ignorance for he feared to tell them the true reason they might have cast reproaches upon him that so great a disaster had overtaken israel in his time then jeremiah journeyed on to the banks of the jordan and there he called as he had been bidden thou son of amram son of amram arise thou art cited to appear before god what has happened this day that god calls me unto him asked moses i know not replied jeremiah again moses thereupon went to the angels and from them he learned that the temple had been destroyed and israel banished from his land weeping and mourning moses joined the patriarchs and together rending their garments and wringing their hands they betook themselves to the ruins of the temple here their wailing was augmented by the loud lamentations of the angels how desolate are the highways to jerusalem the highways destined for travel without end how deserted are the streets that once were thronged at the seasons of the pilgrimages o lord of the world with abraham the father of thy people who taught the world to know thee as the ruler of the universe thou didst make a covenant that through him and his descendants the earth should be filled with people and now thou hast dissolved thy covenant with him o lord of the world thou hast scorned zion and jerusalem once thy chosen habitation thou hast dealt more harshly with israel than with the generation of enosh the first idolaters god thereupon said to the angels why do ye array yourselves against me with your complaints lord of the world they replied on account of abraham thy beloved who has come into thy house wailing and weeping yet thou payest no heed unto him thereupon god since my beloved ended his earthly career he has not been in my house what hath my beloved to do in my house now abraham entered into the conversation why o lord of the world hast thou exiled my children delivered them into the hands of the nations who torture them with all tortures and who have rendered desolate the sanctuary where i was ready to bring thee my son isaac as a sacrifice thy children have sinned said god they have transgressed the whole torah they have offended against every letter of it abraham who is there that will testify against israel that he has transgressed the torah 
god let the torah herself appear and testify the torah came and abraham addressed her o my daughter dost thou indeed come to testify against israel to say that he violated thy commandments dost thou feel no shame remember the day on which god offered thee to all the peoples all the nations of the earth and they all rejected thee with disdain then my children came to sinai they accepted thee and they honoured thee and now on the day of their distress thou standest up against them hearing this the torah stepped aside and did not testify let the twenty-two letters of the hebrew alphabet in which torah is written come and testify against israel said god they appeared without delay and aleph the first letter was about to testify against israel when abraham interrupted it with the words thou chief of all letters thou comest to testify against israel in the time of his distress be mindful of the day on which god revealed himself on mount sinai beginning his words with thee anoki the lord thy god no people no nation accepted thee only my children and now thou comest to testify against them aleph stepped aside and was silent the same happened with the second letter bet and with the third gemel and with all the rest all of them retired abashed and opened not their mouth now abraham turned to god and said o lord of the world when i was a hundred years old thou didst give me a son and when he was in the flower of his age thirty-seven years old thou didst command me to sacrifice him to thee and i like a monster without compassion i bound him upon the altar with mine own hands let that plead with thee and have thou pity on my children then isaac raised his voice and spake o lord of the world when my father told me god will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering my son i did not resist thy word willingly i let myself be tied to the altar my throat was raised to meet the knife let that plead with thee and have thou pity on my children then jacob raised his voice and spake o lord of the world for twenty years i dwelt in the house of laban and when i left it i met with esau who sought to murder my children and i risked my life for theirs and now they are delivered into the hands of their enemies like sheep led to the shambles after i coddled them like fledglings breaking forth from their shells after i suffered anguish for their sake all the days of my life let that plead with thee and have thou pity on my children and at last moses raised his voice and spake o lord of the world was i not a faithful shepherd unto israel for forty long years like a steed i ran ahead of him in the desert and when the time came for him to enter the promised land thou didst command here in the desert shall thy bones drop and now that the children of israel are exiled thou hast sent for me to mourn and lament over them that is what the people mean when they say the good fortune of the master is none for the slave but the master's woe is his woe and turning to jeremiah he continued walk before me i will lead them back let us see who will venture to raise a hand against them jeremiah replied the roads cannot be passed they are blocked with corpses but moses was not to be deterred and the two moses following jeremiah reached the rivers of babylon when the jews saw moses they said the son of amram has ascended from his grave to redeem us from our enemies at that moment a heavenly voice was heard to cry out it is decreed and moses said o my children i cannot redeem you the decree is unalterable may god redeem you speedily and he departed from them the children of israel raised their voices in sore lamentations and the sound of their grief pierced to the very heavens meantime moses returned to the fathers and reported to them to what dire suffering the exiled jews were exposed and they all broke out into woe-begone plaints in his bitter grief moses exclaimed be cursed o son why was not thy light extinguished in the hour in which the enemy invaded the sanctuary the son replied o faithful shepherd i swear by the life i could not grow dark the heavenly powers would not permit it sixty fiery scourges they dealt me and they said go and let thy light shine forth another last complaint moses uttered o lord of the world thou hast written it in thy torah and whether it be cow or you ye shall not kill it and her young both in one day 
how many mothers have they slaughtered with their children and thou art silent then with the suddenness of a flash rachel our mother stood before the holy one blessed be he lord of the world she said thou knowest how overwhelming was jacob's love for me and when i observed that my father thought to put leah in my place i gave jacob secret signs that the plan of my father might be set at naught but then i repented me of what i had done and to spare my sister mortification i disclosed the signs to her more than this i myself was in the bridal chamber and when jacob spake with leah i made reply lest her voice betray her i a woman a creature of flesh and blood of dust and ashes was not jealous of my rival thou o god everlasting king thou eternal and merciful father why wast thou jealous of the idols empty vanities why hast thou driven out my children slain them with swords left them at the mercy of their enemies then the compassion of the supreme god was awakened and he said for thy sake o rachel i will lead the children of israel back to their land jeremiah's journey to babylon when nebuchadnezzar dispatched his general nebuzaradan to the capture of jerusalem he gave him three instructions regarding the mild treatment of jeremiah take him and look well to him and do him no harm but do unto him even as he shall say unto thee at the same time he enjoined him to use pitiless cruelty toward the rest of the people but the prophet desired to share the fate of his suffering brethren and when he saw a company of youths in the pillory he put his own head into it nabazaradan would always withdraw him again thereafter if jeremiah saw a company of old men clapped in chains he would join them and share their ignominy until nebuzaradan released him finally nebuzaradan said to jeremiah lo thou art one of three things either thou art a prophesier of false things or thou art a despiser of suffering or thou art a shedder of blood a prophesier of false things for since many a year hast thou been prophesying the downfall of this city and now when thy prophecy has come true thou sorrowest and mournest or a despiser of suffering for i seek to do thee not harmful and thou thyself pursuest what is harmful to thee as thou to say i am indifferent to pain or a shedder of blood for the king has charged me to have a care of thee and let no harm come upon thee but as thou insistest upon seeking evil for thyself it must be that the king may hear of thy misfortune and put me to death at first jeremiah refused nebuzaradan's offer to let him remain in palestine he joined the march of the captives going to babylon along the highways streaming with blood and strewn with corpses when they arrived at the borders of the holy land they all prophet and people broke out into loud wails and jeremiah said yes brethren and countrymen all this hath befallen you because ye did not hearken unto the words of my prophecy jeremiah journeyed with them until they came to the banks of the euphrates then god spoke to the prophet jeremiah if thou remainest here i shall go with them and if thou goest with them i shall remain here jeremiah replied lord of the world if i go with them what doth it avail them only if their king their creator accompanies them will it bestead them when the captives saw jeremiah make preparations to return to palestine they began to weep and cry o father jeremiah wilt thou too abandon us i call heaven and earth to witness said the prophet had you wept but once in zion ye had not been driven out beset with terrors was the return journey for the prophet corpses lay everywhere and jeremiah gathered up all the fingers that lay about he strained them to his heart fondled them kissed them and wrapped them in his mantle saying sadly did i not tell you my children did i not say to you give glory to the lord your god before he caused darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains dejected oppressed by his grief jeremiah saw the fulfilment of his prophecy against the coquettish maidens of jerusalem who had pursued but the pleasures and enjoyments of the world how often had the prophet admonished them to do penance and lead a god-fearing life in vain whenever he threatened them with the destruction of jerusalem they said why should we concern ourselves about it a prince will take me unto wife said one the other a prefect will marry me and at first it seemed the expectations of jerusalem's fair daughters would be realized for the most aristocratic of the victorious chaldeans 
were charmed by the beauty of the women of jerusalem and offered them their hand and their rank but god sent disfiguring and repulsive diseases upon the women and the babylonians cast them off threw them violently out of their chariots and ruthlessly drove them over the prostrate bodies transportation of the captives nebuchadnezzar's orders were to hurry the captives along the road to babylon without stop or stay he feared the jews might else find opportunity to supplicate the mercy of god and he compassionate as he is would release them instantly they did penance accordingly there was no pause in the forward march until the euphrates was reached there they were within the borders of the empire of nebuchadnezzar and he thought he had nothing more to fear many of the jews died as soon as they drank of the euphrates in their native land they had been accustomed to the water drawn from springs and wells mourning over their dead and over the others that had fallen by the way they sat on the banks of the river while nebuchadnezzar and his princes on their vessels celebrated their victory amid song and music the king noticed that the princes of judah though they were in chains bore no load upon their shoulders and he called to his servants have you no load for these they took the parchment scrolls of the law tore them in pieces made sacks of them and filled them with sand these they loaded upon the backs of the jewish princes at sight of this disgrace all israel broke out into loud weeping the voice of their sorrow pierced the very heavens and god determined to turn the world once more into chaos for he told himself that after all the world was created but for the sake of israel the angels hastened thither and they spake before god o lord of the world the universe is thine is it not enough that thou hast dismembered thy earthly house the temple wilt thou destroy thy heavenly house too god restraining them said do ye think i am a creature of flesh and blood and stand in need of consolation do i not know beginning and end of all things go rather and remove their burdens from the princes of judah aided by god the angels descended and they carried the loads put upon the jewish captives until they reached babylon on their way they passed the city of bari the inhabitants thereof were not a little astonished at the cruelty of nebuchadnezzar who made the captives march naked the people of bari stripped their slaves of their clothes and presented the slaves to nebuchadnezzar when the king expressed his astonishment thereat they said we thought thou wert particularly pleased with naked men the king at once ordered the jews to be arrayed in their garments the reward accorded the bariites was that god endowed them forever with beauty and irresistible grace the compassionate bariites did not find many imitators the very opposite quality was displayed by the ammonites moabites edomites and arabs despite their close kinship with israel their conduct toward the jews was dictated by cruelty the two first mentioned the ammonites and the moabites when they heard the prophet foretell the destruction of jerusalem hastened without a moment's delay to report it to nebuchadnezzar and urge him to attack jerusalem the scruples of the babylonian king who feared god and all the reasons he had advanced against a combat with israel they refuted and finally they induced him to act as they wished at the capture of the city while all the strange nations were seeking booty the ammonites and the moabites threw themselves into the temple to seize the scroll of the law because it contained the clause against their entering into the assembly of the lord even to the tenth generation to disgrace the faith of israel they plucked the cherubim from the holy of holies and dragged them through the streets of jerusalem crying aloud at the same time behold these sacred things that belong to the israelites who say ever they have no idols the edomites were still more hostile in the hour of israel's need they went to jerusalem with nebuchadnezzar but they kept themselves at a distance from the city there to await the outcome of the battle between the jews and the babylonians if the jews had been victorious they would have pretended they had come to bring them aid when nebuchadnezzar's victory became known they showed their true feelings those who escaped the sword of the babylonians were hewn down by the hand of the edomites but in fiendish cunning these nations were surpassed by the ishmaelites eighty thousand young priests each with a golden shield upon his breast succeeded in making their way through the ranks of nebuchadnezzar and in reaching the ishmaelites they asked for water to drink the reply of the ishmaelites was first eat and then you may drink at the same time handing them salt food their thirst was increased 
and the ishmaelites gave them leather bags filled with nothing but air instead of water when they raised them to their mouths the air entered their bodies and they fell dead other arabic tribes showed their hostility openly as the palmyrenes who put eighty thousand archers at the disposal of nebuchadnezzar in his war against israel the sons of moses if nebuchadnezzar thought that once he had the jews in the regions of the euphrates they were in his power forever he was greatly mistaken it was on the very banks of the great river that he suffered the loss of a number of his captives when the first stop was made by the euphrates the jews could no longer contain their grief and they broke out into tears and bitter lamentations nebuchadnezzar bade them be silent and as though to render obedience to his orders the harder he called upon the levites the minstrels of the temple to sing the songs of zion for the entertainment of his guests at the banquet he had arranged the levites consulted with one another not enough that the temple lies in ashes because of our sins should we add to our transgressions by coaxing music from the strings of our holy harps in honour of these dwarfs they said and they determined to offer resistance the murderous babylonians mowed them down in heaps yet they met death with high courage for it saved their sacred instruments from the desecration of being used before idols and for the sake of idolaters the levites who survived the carnage the sons of moses they were bit their own fingers off and when they were asked to play they showed their tyrants mutilated hands with which it was impossible to manipulate their harps at the fall of night a cloud descended and enveloped the sons of moses and all who belonged to them they were hidden from their enemies while their own way was illuminated by a pillar of fire the cloud and the pillar vanished at break of day and before the sons of moses lay a tract of land bordered by the sea on three sides for their complete protection god made the river sambation to flow on the fourth side this river is full of sand and stones and on the six working days of the week they tumble over each other with such vehemence that the crash and the roar are heard far and wide but on the sabbath the tumultuous river subsides into quiet as a guard against trespassers on that day a column of cloud stretches along the whole length of the river and none can approach the sambation within three miles hedged in as they are the sons of moses yet communicate with their brethren of the tribes of naphtali gad and asher who dwell near the banks of the sambation carrier pigeons bear letters hither and thither in the land of the sons of moses there are none but clean animals and in every respect the inhabitants lead a holy and pure life worthy of their ancestor moses they never use an oath and if perchance an oath escapes the lips of one of them he is at once reminded of the divine punishment connected with his act his children would die at a tender age the sons of moses live peaceably and enjoy prosperity as equals through their common jewish faith they have need of neither prince nor judge for they know not strife and litigation each works for the welfare of the community and each takes from the common store only what will satisfy his needs their houses are built of equal height that no one may deem himself above his neighbour and that the fresh air may not be hindered from playing freely about all alike even at night their doors stand wide open for they have naught to fear from thieves nor are wild animals known in their land they all attain a good old age the son never dies before the father when a death occurs there is rejoicing because the departed is known to have entered into life everlasting in loyalty to his faith the birth of a child on the other hand calls forth mourning for who can tell whether the being ushered into the world will be pious and faithful the dead are buried near the doors of their own houses in order that their survivors in all their comings and goings may be reminded of their own end disease is unknown among them for they never sin and sickness is sent only to purify from sins ebed melech the sons of moses were not the only ones to escape from under the heavy hand of nebuchadnezzar still more miraculous was the deliverance of the pious ethiopian ebed melech from the hands of the babylonians he was saved as a reward for rescuing jeremiah when the prophet's life was jeopardized on the day before the destruction of the temple shortly before the enemy forced his way into the city the ethiopian was sent by the prophet jeremiah acting under divine instruction to a certain place in front of the gates of the city 
to dole out refreshments to the poor from a little basket of figs he was to carry with him ebed melek reached the spot but the heat was so intense that he fell asleep under a tree and there he slept for sixty-six years when he woke up the figs were still fresh and juicy but all the surroundings had so changed he could not make out where he was his confusion increased when he entered the city to seek jeremiah and found nothing as it had been he accosted an old man and asked him the name of the place when he was told it was jerusalem ebed melek cried out in amazement where is jeremiah where is baruch and where are all the people the old man was not a little astonished at these questions how was it possible that one who had known jeremiah and jerusalem should be ignorant of the events that had passed sixty years before in brief words he told ebed melek of the destruction of the temple and of the captivity of the people but what he said found no credence with his auditor finally ebed melek realized that god had performed a great miracle for him so that he had been spared the sight of israel's misfortune while he was pouring out his heart in gratitude to god an eagle descended and led him to baruch who lived not far from the city thereupon baruch received the command from god to write to jeremiah that the people should remove the strangers from the midst of them and then god would lead them back to jerusalem the letter written by baruch and some of the figs that had retained their freshness for sixty-six years were carried to babylonia by an eagle who had told baruch that he had been sent to serve him as a messenger the eagle set out on his journey his first halting-place was a dreary waste spot to which he knew jeremiah and the people would come it was the burial-place of the jews which nebuchadnezzar had given the prophet at his solicitation when the eagle saw jeremiah and the people approach with a funeral train he cried out i have a message for thee jeremiah let all the people draw nigh to receive the good tidings as a sign that his mission was true the eagle touched the corpse and it came to life amidst tears all the people cried unto jeremiah save us what must we do to return to our land the eagle brought jeremiah's answer to baruch and after the prophet had sent the babylonian women away he returned to jerusalem with the people those who would not submit to the orders of jeremiah relative to the heathen women were not permitted by the prophet to enter the holy city and as they likewise were not permitted to return to babylonia they founded the city of samaria near jerusalem the temple vessels the task laid upon jeremiah had been twofold besides giving him charge over the people in the land of their exile god had entrusted to him the care of the sanctuary and all it contained the holy ark the altar of incense and the holy tent were carried by an angel to the mount whence moses before his death had viewed the land divinely assigned to israel there jeremiah found a spacious place in which he concealed these sacred utensils some of his companions had gone with him to note the way to the cave but yet they could not find it when jeremiah heard of their purpose he censured them for it was the wish of god that the place of hiding should remain a secret until the redemption and then god himself will make the hidden things visible even the temple vessels not concealed by jeremiah were prevented from falling into the hands of the enemy the gates of the temple sank into the earth and other parts and utensils were hidden in a tower at baghdad by the levite shimur and his friends among these utensils was the seven branch candlestick of pure gold every branch set with twenty-six pearls and beside the pearls two hundred stones of inestimable worth furthermore the tower at baghdad was the hiding-place for seventy-seven golden tables and for the gold with which the walls of the temple had been clothed within and without the tables had been taken from paradise by solomon and in brilliance they outshone the sun and the moon while the gold from the walls excelled in amount and worth all the gold that had existed from the creation of the world until the destruction of the temple the jewels pearls gold and silver and precious gems which david and solomon had intended for the temple were discovered by the scribe hilkiah and he delivered them to the angel shamshiel who in turn deposited the treasure in borsippa the sacred musical instruments were taken charge of and hidden by baruch and zedekiah until the advent of the messiah who will reveal all treasures in his time a stream will break forth from under the place of the holy of holies and flow through the lands to the euphrates and as it flows it will uncover all the treasures buried in the earth 
End of chapter 10 Part 2 The Exile Chapter 10 Part 3 Of The Legends of the Jews Volume 4 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Legends of the Jews, Volume 4, by Louis Ginsburg. Chapter 10, Part 3 The Exile. Baruch. At the time of the destruction of the temple, one of the prominent figures was Baruch, the faithful attendant of Jeremiah. God commanded him to leave the city one day before the enemy was to enter it, in order that his presence might not render it impregnable. On the following day, he and all other pious men having abandoned Jerusalem, he saw from a distance how the angels descended, set fire to the city walls, and concealed the sacred vessels of the temple at first his mourning over the misfortunes of jerusalem and the people knew no bounds but he was in a measure consoled at the end of a seven days fast when god made known to him that the day of reckoning would come for the heathen too other divine visions were vouchsafed him the whole future of mankind was unrolled before his eyes especially the history of israel and he learned that the coming of the messiah would put an end to all sorrow and misery and usher in the reign of peace and joy among men as for him he would be removed from the earth he was told but not through death and only in order to be kept safe against the coming of the end of all time thus consoled baruch addressed an admonition to the people left in palestine and wrote two letters of the same tenor to the exiles one to the nine tribes and a half the other to the two tribes and a half the letter to the nine tribes and a half of the captivity was carried to them by an eagle five years after the great catastrophe he composed a book in babylon which contained penitential prayers and hymns of consolation exhorting israel and urging the people to return to god and his law this book baruch read to king jeconiah and the whole people on a day of prayer and penitence on the same occasion a collection was taken up among the people and the funds thus secured together with the silver temple vessels made by order of zedekiah after jeconiah had been carried away captive were sent to jerusalem with the request that the high priest joachim and the people should apply the money to the sacrificial service and to prayers for the life of king nebuchadnezzar and his son belshazzar thus they might ensure peace and happiness under babylonian rule above all they were to supplicate god to turn away his wrath from his people baruch sent his book also to the residents of jerusalem and they read it in the temple on distinguished days and recited the prayers it contains baruch is one of the few mortals who have been privileged to visit paradise and know its secrets an angel of the lord appeared to him while he was lamenting over the destruction of jerusalem and took him to the seven heavens to the place of judgment where the doom of the godless is pronounced and to the abodes of the blessed he was still among the living at the time in which cyrus permitted the jews to return to palestine but on account of his advanced age he could not avail himself of the permission so long as he was alive his disciple ezra remained with him in babylonia for the study of the law is more important than the building of the temple it was only after the death of baruch that he decided to gather together the exiles who desired to return to the holy land and rebuild the temple in jerusalem the tombs of baruch and ezekiel the piety of baruch and the great favor he enjoyed with god were made known to later generations many years after his death through the marvelous occurrences connected with his tomb once a babylonian prince commanded a jew rabbi solomon by name to show him the grave of ezekiel concerning which he had heard many remarkable tales the jew advised the prince first to enter the tomb of baruch which adjoined that of ezekiel having succeeded in this he might attempt the same with the tomb of ezekiel the teacher of baruch in the presence of his grandees and his people the prince tried to open the grave of baruch but his efforts were fruitless 
whosoever touched it was at once stricken dead an old arab advised the prince to call upon the jews to gain entrance for him seeing that baruch had been a jew and his books were still being studied by jews the jews prepared themselves by fasts prayers penitence and almsgiving and they succeeded in opening the grave without a mishap baruch was found lying on a marble bier and the appearance of the corpse was as though he had only then passed away the prince ordered the bier to be brought to the city and the body to be entombed there he thought it was not seemly that ezekiel and baruch should rest in the same grave but the bearers found it impossible to remove the bier more than two thousand ells from the original grave not even with the help of numerous draught animals could it be urged a single step further following the advice of rabbi solomon the prince resolved to enter the bier on the spot they had reached and also to erect an academy there these miraculous happenings induced the prince to go to mecca there he became convinced of the falseness of mohammedanism of which he had hitherto been an adherent and he converted to judaism he and his whole court near the grave of baruch there grows a species of grass whose leaves are covered with gold dust as the sheen of the gold is not readily noticeable by day the people seek out the place at night mark the very spot on which the grass grows and return by day and gather it not less famous is the tomb of ezekiel at a distance of two thousand ells from baruch's it is overarched by a beautiful mausoleum erected by king jeconiah after evil merodach had released him from captivity the mausoleum existed down to the middle ages and it bore on its walls the names of the thirty-five thousand jews who assisted jeconiah in erecting the monument it was the scene of many miracles when great crowds of people journeyed thither to pay reverence to the memory of the prophet the little low gate in the wall surrounding the grave enlarged in width and height to admit all who desired to enter once a prince vowed to give a colt to the grave of the prophet if but his mare which had been sterile would bear one when his wish was fulfilled however he did not keep his promise but the filly ran a distance equal to a four days journey to the tomb and his owner could not recover it until he deposited his value in silver upon the grave when people went on long journeys they were in the habit of carrying their treasures to the grave of the prophet and beseeching him to let none but the rightful heirs remove them thence the prophet always granted their petition once when an attempt was made to take some books from the grave of ezekiel the ravager suddenly became sick and blind for a time a pillar of fire visible at a great distance rose above the grave of the prophet but it disappeared in consequence of the unseemly conduct of the pilgrims who resorted thither not far from the grave of ezekiel was the grave of barazak who once appeared to a rich jew in a dream he spoke i am barazak one of the princes who were led into captivity with jeremiah i am one of the just if thou wilt erect a handsome mausoleum for me thou wilt be blessed with progeny the jew did as he had been bidden and he who had been childless shortly after became a father daniel the most distinguished member of the babylonian diaspora was daniel though not a prophet he was surpassed by none in wisdom piety and good deeds his firm adherence to judaism he displayed from his early youth when a page at the royal court he refused to partake of the bread wine and oil of the heathen even though the enjoyment of them was not prohibited by the law in general his prominent position at the court was maintained at the cost of many a hardship for he and his companions hananiah mishael and azariah were envied their distinctions by numerous enemies who sought to compass their ruin once they were accused before king nebuchadnezzar of leading an unchaste life the king resolved to order their execution but daniel and his friends mutilated certain parts of their bodies and so demonstrated how unfounded were the charges against them as a youth daniel gave evidence of his wisdom when he convicted two old sinners of having testified falsely against susanna as beautiful as she was good 
misled by the perjured witnesses the court had condemned susanna to death then daniel impelled by a higher power appeared among the people proclaimed that wrong had been done and demanded that the case be reopened and so it was daniel himself cross-questioned the witnesses one after the other the same questions were addressed to both and as the replies did not agree with each other the false witnesses stood condemned and they were made to suffer the penalty they would have had the court inflict upon their victim daniel's high position in the state dates from the time when he interpreted nebuchadnezzar's dream the king said to the astrologers and magicians i know my dream but i do not want to tell you what it was else you will invent anything at all and pretend it is the interpretation of the dream but if you tell me the dream then i shall have confidence in your interpretation of it after much talk between nebuchadnezzar and his wise men they confessed that the king's wish might have been fulfilled if but the temple had still existed the high priest at jerusalem might have revealed the secret by consulting the urim and thummim at this point the king became wrathful against his wise men who had advised him to destroy the temple though they must have known how useful it might become to the king and the state he ordered them all to execution their life was saved by daniel who recited the king's dream and gave its interpretation the king was so filled with admiration of daniel's wisdom that he paid him divine honours daniel however refused such extravagant treatment he did not desire to be the object of idolatrous veneration he left nebuchadnezzar in order to escape the marks of honour thrust upon him and repaired to tiberias where he built a canal besides he was charged by the king with commissions to bring fodder for cattle to babylonia and also swine from alexandria the three men in the furnace during daniel's absence nebuchadnezzar set up an idol and its worship was exacted from all his subjects under penalty of death by fire the image could not stand on account of the disproportion between its height and its thickness the whole of the gold and silver captured by the babylonians in jerusalem was needed to give it steadiness all the nations owning the rule of nebuchadnezzar including even israel obeyed the royal command to worship the image only the three pious companions of daniel hananiah mishael and azariah resisted the order in vain nebuchadnezzar urged upon them as an argument in favour of idolatry that the jews had been so devoted to heathen practices before the destruction of jerusalem that they had gone to babylonia for the purpose of imitating the idols there and bringing the copies they made to jerusalem the three saints would not hearken to these seductions of the king nor when he referred them to such authorities as moses and jeremiah in order to prove to them that they were under obligation to do the royal bidding they said to him thou art our king in all that concerns service taxes poll money and tribute but with respect to thy present command thou art only nebuchadnezzar therein thou and the dog are alike unto us bark like a dog inflate thyself like a water-bottle and chirp like a cricket now nebuchadnezzar's wrath transcended all bound and he ordered the three to be cast into a red-hot furnace so hot that the flames of its fire darted to the height of forty-nine ells beyond the oven and consumed the heathen standing about it no less than four nations were thus exterminated while the three saints were being thrust into the furnace they addressed a fervent prayer to god supplicating his grace toward them and entreating him to put their adversaries to shame the angels desired to descend and rescue the three men in the furnace but god forbade it did the three men act thus for your sakes nay they did it for me and i will save them with mine own hands god also rejected the good offices of your kami the angel of hail who offered to extinguish the fire in the furnace the angel gabriel justly pointed out that such a miracle would not be sufficiently striking to arrest attention his own proposition was accepted he the angel of fire was deputed to snatch the three men from the red-hot furnace he executed his mission by cooling off the fire inside of the oven while on the outside the heat continued to increase to such a degree that the heathen standing around the furnace were consumed the three youths thereupon raised their voices together in a hymn of praise to god thanking him for his miraculous help 
the chaldeans observed the three men pacing up and down quietly in the furnace followed by a fourth the angel gabriel as by an attendant nebuchadnezzar who hastened thither to see the wonder was stunned with fright for he recognized gabriel to be the angel who in the guise of a column of fire had blasted the army of sennacherib six other miracles happened all of them driving terror to the heart of the king the fiery furnace which had been sunk in the ground raised itself into the air it was broken the bottom dropped out the image erected by nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate four nations were wasted by fire and ezekiel revived the dead in the valley of dura of the last nebuchadnezzar was apprised in a peculiar way he had a drinking vessel made of the bones of a slain jew when he was about to use it life began to stir in the bones and a blow was planted in the king's face while a voice announced a friend of this man is at this moment reviving the dead nebuchadnezzar now offered praise to god for the miracles performed and if an angel had not quickly struck him a blow on his mouth and forced him into silence his psalms of praise would have excelled the psalter of david the deliverance of the three pious young men was a brilliant vindication of their ways but at the same time it caused great mortification to the masses of the jewish people who had complied with the order of nebuchadnezzar to worship his idol accordingly when the three men left the furnace which they did not do until nebuchadnezzar invited them to leave the heathen struck all the jews they met in the face deriding them at the same time you who have so marvellous a god pay homage to an idol the three men thereupon left babylonia and went to palestine where they joined their friend the high priest joshua their readiness to sacrifice their lives for the honour of god had been all the more admirable as they had been advised by the prophet ezekiel that no miracle would be done for their sakes when the king's command to bow down before the idol was published and the three men were appointed to act as the representatives of the people hananiah and his companions resorted to daniel for his advice he referred them to the prophet ezekiel who counselled flight citing his teacher isaiah as his authority the three men rejected his advice and declared themselves ready to suffer the death of martyrs ezekiel bade them tarry until he inquired of god whether a miracle would be done for them the words of god were i shall not manifest myself as their saviour they cause my house to be destroyed my palace to be burnt my children to be dispersed among the heathen and now they appeal for my help as i live i will not be found of them instead of discouraging the three men this answer but infused new spirit and resolution in them and they declared with more decided emphasis than before that they were ready to meet death god consoled the weeping prophet by revealing to him that he would save the three saintly heroes he had sought to restrain them from martyrdom only to let their piety and steadfastness appear the brighter on account of their piety it became customary to swear by the name of him who supports the world on three pillars the pillars being the saints hananiah mishael and azariah their deliverance from death by fire worked a great effect upon the disposition of the heathen they were convinced of the uselessness of their idols and with their own hands they destroyed them ezekiel revives the dead among the dead whom ezekiel restored to life at the same time when the three men were redeemed from the fiery furnace were different classes of persons some were the ephraimites that had perished in the attempt to escape from egypt before moses led the whole nation out of the land of bondage some were the godless among the jews that had polluted the temple at jerusalem with heathen rites and those still more godless who in life had not believed in the resurrection of the dead others of those revived by ezekiel were the youths among the jews carried away captive to babylonia by nebuchadnezzar whose beauty was so radiant that it darkened the very splendour of the sun the babylonian women were seized with a great passion for them and at the solicitation of their husbands nebuchadnezzar ordered a bloody massacre of the handsome youths but the babylonian women were not yet cured of their unlawful passion the beauty of the young hebrews haunted them until their corpses lay crushed before them their graceful bodies mutilated these were the youths recalled to life by the prophet ezekiel 
lastly he revived some that had perished only a short time before when hananiah mishael and azariah were saved from death nebuchadnezzar thus addressed the other jews those who had yielded obedience to his command concerning the worship of the idol you know that your god can help and save nevertheless you paid worship to an idol which is incapable of doing anything this proves that as you have destroyed your own land by your wicked deeds so you are now trying to destroy my land with your iniquity forthwith he commanded that they all be executed sixty thousand in number twenty years passed and ezekiel was vouchsafed the vision in which god bade him repair to the valley of dura where nebuchadnezzar had set up his idol and had massacred the host of the jews here god showed him the dry bones of the slain with the question can i revive these bones ezekiel's answer was evasive and as a punishment for his little faith he had to end his days in babylon and was not granted even burial in the soil of palestine god then dropped the dew of heaven upon the dry bones and sinews were upon them and flesh came up and skin covered them above at the same time god sent forth winds to the four corners of the earth which unlocked the treasure-houses of souls and brought its own soul to each body all came to life except one man who as god explained to the prophet was excluded from the resurrection because he was a usurer in spite of the marvellous miracle performed for them the men thus restored to life wept because they feared they would have no share at the end of time in the resurrection of the whole of israel but the prophet assured them in the name of god that their portion in all that had been promised israel should in no wise be diminished nebuchadnezzar a beast nebuchadnezzar the ruler of the whole world to whom even the wild animals paid obedience his pet was a lion with a snake coiled about its neck did not escape punishment for his sins he was chastised as none before him he whom fear of god had at first held back from a war against jerusalem and who had to be dragged forcibly as he sat on his horse to the holy of holies by the archangel michael he later became so arrogant that he thought himself a god and cherished the plan of enveloping himself in a cloud so that he might live apart from men a heavenly voice resounded o thou wicked man son of a wicked man and descendant of nimrod the wicked who incited the world to rebel against god behold the days of the years of a man are threescore years and ten or perhaps by reason of strength fourscore years it takes five hundred years to traverse the distance of the earth from the first heaven and as long a time to penetrate from the bottom to the top of the first heaven and not less are the distances from one of the seven heavens to the next how then canst thou speak of ascending like unto the most high above the heights of the clouds for this transgression of deeming himself more than a man he was punished by being made to live for some time as a beast among beasts treated by them as though he were one of them for forty days he led this life as far down as his navel he had the appearance of an ox and the lower part of his body resembled that of a lion like an ox he ate grass and like a lion he attacked a curious crowd but daniel spent his time in prayer entreating that the seven years of this brutish life allotted to nebuchadnezzar might be reduced to seven months his prayer was granted at the end of forty days reason returned to the king the next forty days he passed in weeping bitterly over his sins and in the interval that remained to complete the seven months he again lived the life of a beast hiram hiram the king of tyre was a contemporary of nebuchadnezzar and in many respects resembled him he too esteemed himself a god and sought to make men believe in his divinity by the artificial heavens he fashioned for himself in the sea he erected four iron pillars on which he built up seven heavens each five hundred ells larger than the one below the first was a plate of glass of five hundred square ells and the second a plate of iron of a thousand square ells the third of lead and separated from the second by canals contained huge round boulders which produced the sound of thunder on the iron the fourth heaven was of brass the fifth of copper the sixth of silver and the seventh of gold all separated from each other by canals in the seventh thirty-five hundred ells in extent 
he had diamonds and pearls which he manipulated so as to produce the effect of flashes and sheets of lightning while the stones below imitated the growling of the thunder as hiram was thus floating above the earth in his vain imagination deeming himself superior to the rest of men he suddenly perceived the prophet ezekiel next to himself he had been waved thither by a wind frightened and amazed hiram asked the prophet how he had risen to his heights the answer was god brought me here and he bade me ask thee why thou art so proud thou born of woman the king of tyre replied defiantly i am not one born of woman i live for ever and as god resides on the sea so my abode is on the sea and as he inhabits seven heavens so do i see how many kings i have survived twenty-one of the house of david and as many of the kingdom of the ten tribes and no less than fifty prophets and ten high priests have i buried thereupon god said i will destroy my house that henceforth hiram may have no reason for self-glorification because all his pride comes only from the circumstance that he furnished the cedar trees for the building of the temple the end of this proud king was that he was conquered by nebuchadnezzar deprived of his throne and made to suffer a cruel death though the babylonian king was the stepson of hiram he had no mercy with him daily he cut off a bit of the flesh of his body and forced the tyrian king to eat it until he finally perished hiram's palace was swallowed by the earth and in the bowels of the earth it will remain until it shall emerge in the future world as the habitation of the pious the false prophets not only among the heathen but also among the jews there were very sinful people in those days the most notorious jewish sinners were the two false prophets ahab and zedekiah ahab came to the daughter of nebuchadnezzar and said yield thyself to zedekiah telling her this in the form of a divine message the same was done by zedekiah who only varied the message by substituting the name of ahab the princess could not accept such messages as divine and she told her father what had occurred though nebuchadnezzar was so addicted to immoral practices that he was in the habit of making his captive kings drunk and then satisfying his unnatural lusts upon them and a miracle had to interpose to shield the pious of judah against this disgrace yet he well knew that the god of the jews hates immorality he therefore questioned hananiah mishael and azariah about it and they emphatically denied the possibility that such a message could have come from god the prophets of lies refused to recall their statements and nebuchadnezzar decided to subject them to the same fiery test as he had decreed for the three pious companions of daniel to be fair toward them the king permitted them to choose a third fellow sufferer some pious man to share their lot seeing no escape ahab and zedekiah asked for joshua later the high priest as their companion in the furnace in the hope that his distinguished merits would suffice to save all three of them they were mistaken joshua emerged unhurt only his garments were seared but the false prophets were consumed joshua explained the singeing of his garments by the fact that he was directly exposed to the full fury of the flames but the truth was that he had to expiate the sins of his sons who had contracted marriages unworthy of their dignity and descent therefore their father escaped death only after the fire had burnt his garments daniel's piety no greater contrast to hiram and the false prophets ahab and zedekiah can be imagined than is presented by the character of the pious daniel when nebuchadnezzar offered him divine honours he refused what hiram sought to obtain by every means in his power the babylonian king felt so ardent an admiration for daniel that he sent him from the country when the time arrived to worship the idol he had erected in dura for he knew very well that daniel would prefer death in the flames to disregard of the commands of god and he could not well have cast the man into the fire to whom he had paid divine homage moreover it was the wish of god that daniel should not pass through the fiery ordeal at the same time as his three friends in order that their deliverance might not be ascribed to him in spite of all this nebuchadnezzar endeavoured to persuade daniel by gentle means to worship an idol he had the golden diadem of the high priest inserted in the mouth of an idol 
and by reason of the wondrous power that resides in the holy name inscribed on the diadem the idol gained the ability to speak and it said the words i am thy god thus were many seduced to worship the image but daniel could not be misled so easily he secured permission from the king to kiss the idol laying his mouth upon the idols he adjured the diadem in the following words i am but flesh and blood yet at the same time a messenger of god i therefore admonish thee take heed that the name of the holy one blessed be he may not be desecrated and i order thee to follow me so it happened when the heathen came with music and song to give honour to the idol it emitted no sound but a storm broke loose and overturned it on still another occasion nebuchadnezzar tried to persuade daniel to worship an idol this time a dragon that devoured all who approached it and therefore was adored as a god by the babylonians daniel had straw mixed with nails fed to him and the dragon ate and perished almost immediately all this did not prevent daniel from keeping the welfare of the king in mind continually hence it was that when nebuchadnezzar was engaged in setting his house in order he desired to mention daniel in his will as one of his heirs but the jew refused with the words far be it from me to leave the inheritance of my fathers for that of the uncircumcised nebuchadnezzar died after having reigned forty years as long as king david the death of the tyrant brought hope and joy to many a heart for his severity had been such that during his lifetime none dared laugh and when he descended to sheol its inhabitants trembled fearing he had come to reign over them too however a heavenly voice called to him go down and be thou laid down with the uncircumcised the interment of this great king was anything but what one might have expected and for this reason during the seven years spent by nebuchadnezzar among the beasts his son evil merodach ruled in his stead nebuchadnezzar reappeared after his period of penance and incarcerated his son for life when the death of nebuchadnezzar actually did occur evil merodach refused to accept the homage the nobles brought him as the new king because he feared that his father was not dead but had only disappeared as once before and would return again to convince him of the groundlessness of his apprehension the corpse of nebuchadnezzar badly mutilated by his enemies was dragged through the streets shortly afterward occurred the death of zedekiah the dethroned king of judah his burial took place amid great demonstrations of sympathy and mourning the elegy over him ran thus alas that king zedekiah had to die he who quaffed the lees which all the generations before him accumulated zedekiah reached a good old age for though it was in his reign that the destruction of jerusalem took place yet it was the guilt of the nation not of the king that had brought about the catastrophe End of chapter ten part three the exile chapter eleven of the legends of the jews volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the legends of the jews volume four by lewis ginsburg chapter eleven the return of the captivity belshazzar's feast when god resolved to take revenge upon babylon for all the sufferings it had inflicted on israel he chose darius and cyrus as the agents of vengeance cyrus the king of persia and his father-in-law darius the king of medea together went up against belshazzar the ruler of the chaldeans the war lasted a considerable time and fortune favoured first one side then the other until finally the chaldeans won a decisive victory to celebrate the event belshazzar arranged a great banquet which was served from the vessels taken out of the temple at jerusalem by his father while the king and his guests were feasting the angel sent by god put the meany meany tekel up harson on the wall aramaic words and hebrew characters written with red ink the angel was seen by none but the king his grandees and the princes of the realm who were present at the orgy perceived nothing the king himself did not see the form of the angel only his awesome fingers as they traced the words were visible to him 
the interpretation given to the enigmatical words by daniel put an end to the merrymaking of the feasters they scattered in dread and fear leaving none behind except the king and his attendants in the same night the king was murdered by an old servant who knew daniel from the time of nebuchadnezzar and doubted not that his sinister prophecy would be fulfilled with the head of king belshazzar he betook himself to darius and cyrus and told them how his master had desecrated the sacred vessels told them of the wonderful writing on the wall and of the way it had been interpreted by daniel the two kings were moved by his recital to vow solemnly that they would permit the jews to return to palestine and would grant them the use of the temple vessels they resumed the war against babylonia with more energy and god vouchsafed them victory they conquered the whole of belshazzar's realm and took possession of the city of babylon whose inhabitants young and old were made to suffer death the subjugated lands were divided between cyrus and darius the latter receiving babylon and medea the former chaldea persia and assyria but this is not the whole story of the fall of babylon the wicked king belshazzar arranged the banquet at which the holy vessels were desecrated in the fifth year of his reign because he thought it wholly certain then that all danger was past of the realization of jeremiah's prophecy foretelling the return of the jews to palestine at the end of seventy years of babylonian rule over them nebuchadnezzar had governed twenty-five years and evil merodach twenty-three leaving five years in the reign of belshazzar for the fulfilment of the appointed time not enough that the king scoffed at god by using the temple vessels he needs must have the pastry for the banquet which was given on the second day of the passover festival made of wheaten flour finer than that used on this day for the omer in the temple punishment followed hard upon the heels of the atrocity cyrus and darius served as doorkeepers of the royal palace on the evening of the banquet they had received orders from belshazzar to admit none though he should say he was the king himself belshazzar was forced to leave his apartments for a short time and he went out unnoticed by the two doorkeepers on his return when he asked to be admitted they felled him dead even while he was asseverating that he was the king daniel under the persian kings daniel left belshazzar and fled to shushtar where he was kindly received by cyrus who promised him to have the temple vessels taken back to jerusalem provided daniel would pray to god to grant him success in his war with the king of mosul god gave daniel's prayer a favorable hearing and cyrus was true to his promise daniel now received the divine charge to urge cyrus to rebuild the temple to this end he was to introduce ezra and zerubbabel to the king ezra then went from place to place and called upon the people to return to palestine sad to say only a tribe and a half obeyed his summons indeed the majority of the people were so wroth against ezra that they sought to slay him he escaped the peril to his life only by a divine miracle daniel too was exposed to much suffering at this time king cyrus cast him into a den of lions because he refused to bow down before the idol of the king for seven days daniel lay among the wild beasts and not a hair of his head was touched when the king at the end of the week found daniel alive he could not but acknowledge the sovereign grandeur of god cyrus released daniel and instead had his calumniators thrown to the lions in an instant they were rent in pieces in general cyrus fell far short of coming up to the expectations set in him for piety and justice though he granted permission to the jews to rebuild the temple they were to use no material but wood so that it might easily be destroyed if the jews should take it into their head to rebel against him even in point of morals the persian king was not above reproach another time cyrus pressingly urged daniel to pay homage to the idol bell as proof of the divinity of the idol the king advanced the fact that it ate the dishes set before it a report spread by the priests of bel who entered the temple of the idol at night through subterranean passages themselves ate up the dishes and then attributed their disappearance to the appetite of the god but daniel was too shrewd to be misled by a fabricated story he had the ashes strewn upon the floor of the temple 
and the footprints visible the next morning convinced the king of the deceit practised by the priests pleasant relations did not continue to subsist for ever between cyrus and darius a war broke out between them in which cyrus lost life and lands fearing darius daniel fled to persia but an angel of god appeared to him with the message fear not the king not unto him will i surrender thee shortly afterward he received a letter from darius reading as follows come to me daniel fear naught i shall be even kinder to thee than cyrus was accordingly daniel returned to shushtar and was received with great consideration by darius one day the king chanced to remember the sacred garments brought by nebuchadnezzar out of the temple at jerusalem to babylon they had vanished and no trace of them could be discovered the king suspected daniel of having had something to do with their disappearance it booted little that he protested his innocence he was cast into prison god sent an angel who was to blind darius telling him at the same time that he was deprived of the light of his eyes because he was keeping the pious daniel in durance and sight would be restored to him only if daniel interceded for him the king at once released daniel and the two together journeyed to jerusalem to pray on the holy place for the restoration of the king an angel appeared to daniel and announced to him that his prayer had been heard the king had but to wash his eyes and vision would return to them so it happened darius gave thanks to god and in his gratitude assigned the tithe of his grain to the priests and the levites besides he testified his appreciation to daniel by loading him down with gifts and both returned to shushtar the recovery of the king convinced many of his subjects of the omnipotence of god and then converted to judaism following the advice of daniel darius appointed a triumvirate to take charge of the administration of his realm and daniel was made the chief of the council of three his high dignity he was second to none but the king himself exposed him to envy and hostility on all sides his enemies plotted his ruin with cunning they induced the king to sign an order attaching the penalty of death to prayers addressed to any god or any man other than darius though the order did not require daniel to commit a sin he preferred to give his life for the honour of the one god rather than omit his devotions to him when his jealous enemies surprised him during his prayers he did not interrupt himself he was dragged before the king who refused to give credence to the charge against daniel meanwhile the hour for the afternoon prayer arrived and in the presence of the king and his princes daniel began to perform his devotions this naturally rendered unavailing all efforts made by the king to save his friend from death daniel was cast into a pit full of lions the entrance to the pit was closed up with a rock which had all of its own accord rolled from palestine to protect him against any harm contemplated by his enemies the ferocious beasts welcomed the pious daniel like dogs fawning upon their master on his return home licking his hands and wagging their tails while this was passing in babylon an angel appeared to the prophet habakkuk in judea he ordered the prophet to bring daniel the food he was about to carry to his labourers in the field astonished habakkuk asked the angel how he could carry it to so great a distance whereupon he was seized by his hair and in a moment he sat down before daniel they dined together and then the angel transported habakkuk back to his place in palestine early in the morning darius went to the pit of the lions to discover the fate of daniel the king called his name but he received no answer because daniel was reciting the shema at that moment after having spent the night in giving praise and adoration to god seeing that he was still alive the king summoned the enemies of daniel to the pit it was their opinion that the lions had not been hungry and therefore daniel was still unhurt the king commanded them to put the beasts to the test with their own persons the result was that the hundred and twenty-two enemies of daniel together with their wives and children numbering two hundred and forty-four persons were torn in shreds by fourteen hundred and sixty-four lions the miraculous escape of daniel brought him more distinguished consideration and greater honours than before the king published the wonders done by god in all parts of his land and called upon the people to betake themselves to jerusalem and help in the erection of the temple 
daniel entreated the king to relieve him of the duties of his position for the performance of which he no longer felt himself fit on account of his advanced age the king consented on condition that daniel designate a successor worthy of him his choice fell upon zerubbabel loaded with rich presents and amid public demonstrations designed to honour him daniel retired from public life he settled in the city of shushan where he abode until his end though he was no prophet god vouchsafed to him a knowledge of the end of time not granted his friends the prophets haggai zechariah and malachi but even he in the fulness of his years lost all memory of the revelation with which he had been favoured the grave of daniel daniel was buried in shushan on account of which a sore quarrel was enkindled among the inhabitants of the city shushan is divided in two parts by a river the side containing the grave of daniel was occupied by the wealthy inhabitants and the poor citizens lived on the other side of the river the latter maintained that they too would be rich if the grave of daniel were in their quarter the frequent disputes and conflicts were finally adjusted by a compromise one year the bier of daniel reposed on one side of the river the next year on the other when the persian king sanjar came to shushan he put a stop to the practice of dragging the bier hither and thither he resorted to another device for guarding the peace of the city he had the bier suspended from chains precisely in the middle of the bridge spanning the river in the same spot he erected a house of prayer for all confessions and out of respect to daniel he prohibited fishing in the river for a distance of a mile on either side of the memorial building the sacredness of the spot appeared when the godless tried to pass by they were drowned while the pious remained unscathed furthermore the fish that swam near it had heads glittering like gold beside the house of daniel lay a stone under which he had concealed the holy temple vessels once an attempt was made to roll the stone from its place but whoever ventured to touch it fell dead the same fate overtook all who later tried to make excavations near the spot a storm broke out and mowed them down zerubbabel the successor to daniel in the service of the king zerubbabel enjoyed equally as much royal consideration and affection he occupied a higher position than all the other servants and officials and he and two others constituted the bodyguard of the king once when the king lay wrapped in deep slumber his guards resolved to write down what each of them considered the mightiest thing in the world and he who wrote the sages saying should be given rich presents and rewards by the king what they wrote they laid under the pillow on which the head of the king rested that he might not delay to make a decision after he awoke the first one wrote wine is the mightiest thing there is the second wrote the king is the mightiest on earth and the third zerubbabel wrote women are the mightiest in the world but truth prevails over all else when the king awoke and he perused the document he summoned the grandees of his realm and the three youths as well each of the three was called upon to justify his saying in eloquent words the first described the potency of wine when it takes possession of the senses of a man he forgets grief and sorrow still more beautiful and convincing were the words of the second speaker when his turn came to establish the truth of his saying that the king was the mightiest on earth finally zerubbabel depicted in glowing words the power of woman who rules even over kings but he continued truth is supreme over all the whole earth asks for truth the heavens sing the praises of truth all creation quakes and trembles before truth naught of wrong can be found in truth unto truth belongeth the might the dominion the power and the glory of all times blessed be the god of truth when zerubbabel ceased from speaking the assembly broke out into the words great is truth it is mightier than all else the king was so charmed with the wisdom of zerubbabel that he said to him ask for aught thou wishest it shall be granted thee 
zerubbabel required nothing for himself he only sought permission of the king to restore jerusalem rebuild the sanctuary and return the holy temple vessels to the place whence they had been carried off not only did darius grant what zerubbabel wished for not only did he give him letters of safe conduct but he also conferred numerous privileges upon the jews who accompanied zerubbabel to palestine and he sent abundant presents to the temple and its officers as unto his predecessor daniel so unto zerubbabel god vouchsafed a knowledge of the secrets of the future especially the archangel metatron dealt kindly with him besides revealing to him the time at which the messiah would appear he brought about an interview between the messiah and zerubbabel in reality zerubbabel was none other than nehemiah who was given this second name because he was born in babylon richly endowed as zerubbabel nehemiah was with admirable qualities he yet did not lack faults he was excessively self-complacent and he did not hesitate to fasten a stigma publicly upon his predecessors in the office of governor in the land of judah among whom was so excellent a man as daniel to punish him for these transgressions the book of ezra does not bear the name of its real author nehemiah when darius felt his end approach he appointed his son-in-law cyrus who had hitherto reigned only over persia to be the ruler over his kingdom as well his wish was honoured by the princes of media and persia after darius had departed this life cyrus was proclaimed king in the very first year of his reign cyrus summoned the most distinguished of the jews to appear before him and he gave them permission to return to palestine and rebuild the temple at jerusalem more than this he pledged himself to contribute to the temple service in proportion to his means and pay honour to the god who had invested him with strength to subdue the chaldeans these actions of cyrus partly flowed from his own pious inclinations and partly were due to his desire to accomplish the dying behests of darius who had admonished him to give the jews the opportunity of rebuilding the temple when the first sacrifice was to be brought by the company of jews who returned to jerusalem under the leadership of ezra and set about restoring the temple they missed the celestial fire which had dropped from heaven on the altar in the time of moses and had not been extinguished so long as the temple stood they turned in supplication to god to be instructed by him the celestial fire had been hidden by jeremiah at the time of the destruction of the holy city and the law did not permit them to bring strange fire upon the altar of god an old man suddenly remembered the spot in which jeremiah had buried the holy fire and he led the elders thither they rolled away the stone covering the spot and from under it appeared a spring flowing not with water but with a sort of oil ezra ordered this fluid to be sprinkled upon the altar and forthwith an all-consuming flame shot up the priests themselves scattered in fright but after the temple and its vessels were purified by the flame it confined itself to the altar never more to leave it for the priest guarded it so that it might not be extinguished among the band of returned exiles were the prophets haggai zechariah and malachi each one of them had a place of the greatest importance to fill in the rebuilding of the temple by the first the people were shown the plan of the altar which was larger than the one that had stood in solomon's temple the second informed them of the exact location of the altar and the third taught them that the sacrifices might be brought on the holy place even before the completion of the temple on the authority of one of the prophets the jews on their return from babylonia gave up their original hebrew characters and rewrote the torah in the assyrian characters still in use at this day while the temple work was in progress the builders found the skull of arana the owner of the temple site in the time of david the priests unlearned as they were could not decide to what extent the corpse lying there had defiled the holy place it was for this that haggai poured out his reproaches upon them ezra the complete resettlement of palestine took place under the direction of ezra or as the scriptures sometimes call him malachi 
he had not been present at the earlier attempts to restore the sanctuary because he could not leave his old teacher baruch who was too advanced in years to venture upon the difficult journey to the holy land in spite of ezra's persuasive efforts it was but a comparatively small portion of the people that joined the procession winding its way westward to palestine for this reason the prophetical spirit did not show itself during the existence of the second temple haggai zechariah and malachi were the last representatives of prophecy nothing was more surprising than the apathy of the levites they manifested no desire to return to palestine their punishment was the loss of the tithes which were later given to the priest though the levites had the first claim upon them in restoring the jewish state in palestine ezra cherished two hopes to preserve the purity of the jewish race and to spread the study of the torah until it should become the common property of the people at large to help on his first purpose he inveighed against marriages between the jews and the nations round about he himself had carefully worked out his own pedigree before he consented to leave babylonia and in order to perpetuate the purity of the families and groups remaining in the east he took all the unfit with him to palestine in the realization of his second hope the spread of the torah ezra was so zealous and efficient that it was justly said of him if moses had not anticipated him ezra would have received the torah in a sense he was indeed a second moses the torah had fallen into neglect and oblivion in his day and he restored and re-established it in the minds of his people it is due to him chiefly that it was divided up into portions to be read annually sabbath after sabbath in the synagogues and he it was likewise who originated the idea of rewriting the pentateuch in assyrian characters to further his purpose still more he ordered additional schools for children to be established everywhere though the old ones sufficed to satisfy the demand he thought the rivalry between the old and the new institutions would redound to the benefit of the pupils ezra is the originator of institutions known as the ten regulations of ezra they are the following one readings from the torah on sabbath afternoons two readings from the torah on mondays and thursdays three sessions of the court on mondays and thursdays four to do laundry work on thursdays not fridays five to eat garlic on friday on account of its salutary action six to bake bread early in the morning that it may be ready for the poor whenever they ask for some seven women are to cover the lower parts of their bodies with a garment called sinar eight before taking a ritual bath the hair is to be combed nine the ritual bath prescribed for the unclean is to cover the case of one who desires to offer prayer or study the law ten permission to peddlers to sell cosmetics to women in the towns ezra was not only a great teacher of his people and their wise leader he was also their advocate with the celestials to whom his relation was of a peculiarly intimate character once he addressed a prayer to god in which he complained of the misfortune of israel and the prosperity of the heathen nations thereupon the angel uriel appeared to him and instructed him how that evil has its appointed time in which to run its course as the dead have their appointed time to sojourn in the nether world ezra could not rest satisfied with this explanation and in response to his further question seven prophetic visions were vouchsafed him and interpreted by the angel for him they typified the whole course of history up to his day and disclosed the future to his eyes in the seventh vision he heard a voice from a thorn-bush like moses aforetimes and it admonished him to guard in his heart the secrets revealed to him the same voice had given moses a similar injunction these words shalt thou publish those shalt thou keep secret then his early translation from earth was announced to him he besought god to let the holy spirit descend upon him before he died so that he might record all that had happened since the creation of the world as it was set down in the torah and guide men upon the path that leads to god hereupon god bade him take the five experienced scribes sarga debria seleucia 
ethan and oziel with him into retirement and dictate to them for forty days after one day spent with these writers in isolation remote from the city and from men a voice admonished him ezra open thy mouth and drink whereof i give thee to drink he opened his mouth and a chalice was handed to him filled to the brim with a liquid that flowed like water but in colour resembled fire his mouth opened to drink and for forty days it was not closed during all that time the five scribes put down in signs they did not understand they were the newly adopted hebrew characters all that ezra dictated to them and it made ninety-four books at the end of the forty days period god spoke to ezra thus the twenty-four books of the holy scriptures thou shalt publish for the worthy and the unworthy alike to read but the last seventy books thou shalt withhold from the populace for the perusal of the wise of thy people on account of his literary activity he is called the scribe of the science of the supreme being unto all eternity having finished his task ezra was removed from this mundane world and he entered the life everlasting but his death did not occur in the holy land it overtook him at khuzistan in persia on his journey to king artakshashta at rasia in mesopotamia there stood as late as the twelfth century the synagogue founded by ezra when he was journeying from babylonia to palestine at his grave over which columns of fire are often seen to hover at night a miracle once happened a shepherd fell asleep by the side of it ezra appeared to him and bade him tell the jews that they were to transport his bier to another spot if the master of the new place refused assent he was to be warned to yield permission else all the inhabitants of his place would perish at first the master refused to allow the necessary excavations to be made only after a large number of the non-jewish inhabitants of the place had been stricken down suddenly he consented to have the corpse transported thither as soon as the grave was opened the plague ceased shortly before the death of ezra the city of babylon was totally destroyed by the persians there remained but a portion of the wall which was impregnable by human strength all the prophecies hurled against the city by the prophets were accomplished to this day there is a spot on its site which no animal can pass unless some of the earth of the place is strewn upon it the men of the great assembly at the same time with ezra or to speak more accurately under his direction the great assembly carried on its beneficent activities which laid the foundations of rabbinical judaism and constituted the binding link between the jewish prophet and the jewish sage the great men who belonged to this august assembly once succeeded through the efficacy of their prayers in laying hands upon the seducers unto sin and confining them to prevent them from doing more mischief thus they banished from the world the desire unto idolatry they tried to do the same to the desire unto lustfulness this evil adversary warned them against making away with him for the world would cease to exist without him for three days they kept him a prisoner but then they had to dismiss him and let him go free they found that not even an egg was to be had for sexual appetite had vanished from the world however he did not escape altogether unscathed they plastered up his eyes and from that time on he gave up inflaming the passions of men against their blood relations among the decrees and ordinances of the great assembly the most prominent is the fixation of the prayer of the eighteen benedictions the several benedictions composing this prayer date back to remote ancient times the patriarchs were their authors and the work of the great assembly was to put them together in the order in which we now have them we know how each of the benedictions originated one when abraham was saved from the furnace angels spoke blessed art thou o lord the shield of abraham which is the essence of the first of the eighteen two when isaac lay stunned by fright on mount moriah god sent his dew to revive him whereupon the angels spoke blessed art thou o lord who quickenest the dead three when jacob arrived at the gates of heaven and proclaimed the holiness of god the angels spoke blessed art thou o lord 
thou holy god four when pharaoh was about to make joseph the ruler over egypt and it appeared that he was unacquainted with the seventy tongues which an egyptian sovereign must know the angel gabriel came and taught him those languages whereupon the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who graciously bestowest knowledge five when reuben committed the trespass against his father sentence of death was pronounced upon him in the heavens but when he repented he was permitted to continue to live and the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who hast delight in repentance six when judah had committed a trespass against tamar and confessing his guilt obtained forgiveness the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who pardonest greatly seven when israel was sore oppressed by mizraim and god proclaimed his redemption the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who redeemest israel eight when the angel raphael came to abraham to soothe the pain of his circumcision the angels spoke blessed art thou o lord who healest the sick nine when israel sowing in the land of the philistines bore an abundant harvest the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who blessest the years ten when jacob was reunited with joseph and simon in egypt the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who gatherest the dispersed of thy people israel eleven when the torah was revealed and god communicated the code of laws to moses the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who lovest righteousness and justice twelve when the egyptians were drowned in the red sea the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who shatterest the enemy and humiliatest the presumptuous thirteen when joseph laid his hands on the eyes of his father jacob the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who art the stay and the support of the pious fourteen when solomon built the temple the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who buildest jerusalem fifteen when the children of israel singing hymns of praise unto god passed through the red sea the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who causest the hour of salvation to sprout forth sixteen when god lent a gracious ear to the prayer of the suffering israelites in egypt the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who hearest our prayer seventeen when the shekinah descended between the cherubim in the tabernacle the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who wilt restore thy divine presence to jerusalem eighteen when solomon dedicated his temple the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord whose name is worthy of praise nineteen when israel entered the holy land the angel spoke blessed art thou o lord who establishest peace End of chapter eleven the return of the captivity